All right, so we're going to do a quick video kind of describing the workflow in Agisoft Metashape. Um, here before you, I've got a folder where I have some of the projects I've been working on, and we're going to open up this one here called Nexicho Glyph. And as you can see inside of that folder, I've got a three folder structure, one of them that says photos, another one output, and the other one says export. And so what you want to do to get started is take all your photos of the object for photogrammetry and dump them into here. So you will likely have raw photos and JPEGs all in one to go ahead and dump both of them in here in their photos folder. So now what you want to do is create an Agisoft project. So you can just open up Agisoft. And once it's open, um, you can go ahead and hit file, save as, um, go find that place where you're going to save it. Mine was the next each glyph. And you want to save it here in the output folder. So I already have one saved from before. I'm going to go ahead and save a different version here. All right, should say it up here in the top left and we're ready to get started. So the first things first, um, identify this tab up here called Workflow. Uh, the Workflow tab, when you click it, it has all the things necessary that you would need in order to put together a 3D model using photos, uh, including where to start. So we're gonna go ahead and click here at Add Photos, and we're gonna search for that Photos folder. And we're gonna have, we're gonna wanna take every single photo that you um, took in the field, so we'll hit Control A. Control A just allows you to highlight everything, and then hit Open, and you'll see them populate in the Photos pane in Agisoft. So I can see them over here. If I want to inspect my photos within the software, all you have to do is give it a uh, double click, and then you can use the mouse scroll to actually zoom in and out to check different parts of your your image to see if you have a good photo or bad photo. Um, another trick is to right click your photo and then go to where it says estimate image quality. And you can actually have the computer estimate the image quality for all of your cameras by doing that. Um, it'll give you a value between 0 and uh, 1 and typically you want something above the threshold of 0.5 to be a good photo. So just a little tip there. Um, to get started, go ahead and close that out. Hit Workflow, Align Photos. This is the first step. Is you want to get all these photos aligned to recalculate that geometry. Uh, basically, it's going to look for key points and tie points in every single image, trying to match them to other images so it can get rolling. We're going to leave it in high, and anytime you do an alignment, my advice is just to have it on high. Generic preselection is just fine. Uh, and then you could theoretically go ahead and hit OK with all the default settings. If you ever want to play around with those, you just click here in Advanced, open up Key Point Limit and Tie Point Limit. Um, you can change these values around a little bit, and my advice would be to get on the um, Agisoft Metashape manual and look up what these things mean, and you, you will be able to kind of make some judgment calls as to how you might want to change those numbers around. But let's just go ahead and hit OK, and it'll run a photo alignment. Okay, looks like we uh, finished our photo alignment here and we have all of our photos aligned. If you just kind of click here in this little transparent ball, you can spin things around. This is kind of a little tumbler for you to navigate in 3D space. Um, the other control you want to get used to is the middle mouse button, clicking it down and dragging. This is how you pan the model from side to side. Zooming is just scrolling with the mouse scroll. Um, and then of course tumbling, right? And then the last thing is if, if you, for some reason the model's like way out here and your tumbler's swinging it around like this, just double click the model and it puts it right there in the center of your tumbler so you can kind of reset um, the navigation. So looking at the images, it looks like we have good coverage right in here. Um, I took a few context shots back here, but you can actually see the side of the wall forming. You know, it's kind of a zigzag, and this I was very focused on this glyph that was on a stone here built into the side of the wall. So this is typically where you say, okay, I've got a successful um, photo set, 
that has been aligned and the rest of it is likely to be a good model. So as long as you can see the general image or the general shape of the feature that you're trying to take, uh, it's usually a success. So the next step, um, which actually, by the way, if you are trying to get these little cameras to come up so you can see the camera positions, you toggle this on and off where it says show cameras. And that's what makes that appear. If you're just getting blue tiles with no image on the back and you want the images, then you just hit the down arrow, click on show thumbnails, and that toggles on the image to the back of the, th the, the camera position. So the next step, I'm going to turn these off, would be to create a dense cloud. Again, you go back to your workflow tab, click on dense cloud, and you've got a few choices to make here. I would just leave it on default for now and run what you have there on low. Uh, low is just going to save a little bit of time, but it will make, um, it will create less points uh, on the object itself. But if you want to test some out, some uh, more dense clouds, you can put in you know medium or high. It's just going to put more points on the surface of your object that'll later later be interpolated into a mesh. So we're going to hit low, and we're going to go ahead and hit change depth filtering to aggressive, and we're going to hit OK. All right. I don't know how long you waited, but I, with the magic of videos and online videos I was able to kind of have it go right to the dense cloud here. Um, as you can see there's a lot of points now on the surface and when I zoom out you can definitely see your object. Um, there are probably some extraneous points that could be cut away to kind of improve your model so at this point you can start making some decisions as to what you what you actually want to delete. So over here next to the little arrow icon is your selection tool which I tend to use the freeform selection. You drop that down, click on freeform, and that way you have a little lasso. See that? So you can actually lasso groups of these points and then just hit the delete key and it gets rid of them. That way it doesn't affect your model in any way. So I know I want to get rid of all these points, so I'll get my lasso out. of all of those delete nice looks a little bit better maybe I don't want the top of this so I just kind of swing the lasso around and hit delete uh, and the bottom looks good I'll just leave it the way it is now the tumbler ball is gone and you may be trying to move this around and visualize it differently but there's just a selection tool you have to keep in mind you have to switch back to the tumbler which is this little arrow here and now the ball is back in in there uh, to deselect, usually what I do is I just grab the selection tool and select off the model, and it gets rid of the pink selection, and then I go back to your little arrow. Okay, our next step here um, is to go to Workflow again and go to Build Mesh. Click on that. We're going to get another dialog, reminiscent of what just happened there with the dense cloud. And in the dialog, it's going to ask you what you want to interpolate. What's the source data? And we're going to choose dense cloud since that's what we just created. Uh, leaving everything there in default, except think a little bit more about how many polygons you want um, to create your model. And you'll see what I mean in just a second, what, what I mean by faces or polygons for a 3D model. I'm going to go ahead and choose medium, and I'm going to click OK, and it'll, it'll skip to the mesh. It looks like we're almost done. There we go. Got the mesh. Um, over here in your visualization uh, tools up top, you know, you have your sparse cloud, your dense cloud tool or visualization, and then you have a mesh visualization that shows up as a little green triangle. When you click that, you'll notice that it has become solid. It's no longer points, so you can zoom in, and it looks kind of distorted. What you're looking at is a colorized mesh or a shaded mesh. Um, if you drop this down, you can look at it solid to see what the geometry looks like. Um, you can also look at it as a wireframe. And when you look at the wireframe, you see kind of what I was talking about with polygons or faces, but you have multiple triangles that are just kind of, you know, put together to create the 3D um, geometry of the object itself. Down here in the bottom left, you can see how many faces are actually making up the object. And here we have 60,000. 
the higher that number, the more definition you're going to see in your object, but also the longer it's going to take to compute. So the next step here, if we if we were happy with what we see and we don't want to edit anymore, I'm just going to edit. I'm going to get the freeform tool and I'm going to kind of straighten up the bottom here and hit delete. All right. I'm going to save my progress. Once we're ready to move on, we'll go back to the workflow tab. We'll go to build texture, which is our final step. And to be honest with any sort of object or feature um, that's fairly, you know, good size to small, you can just leave everything on default here and just hit OK. So now what it's going to do is take all of your photos um, and find the best photos uh, for the job to actually wrap and create a photorealistic texture wrapping the photos around the 3D object. And so it's going to recalculate and stretch these images um, to work around the geometry there. So we'll wait on that. All right, so your texture finally finished processing, and now you are looking for it, and it's nowhere to be seen. Um, you might have to actually activate it up here, where you kind of click down the green pyramid, your mesh, and you click on the textured mesh, actually showing the texture wrapped around the mesh. So click it. Sometimes it'll take a little while to pop up um, because it takes, it, you know, for some reason it's computationally heavy and it takes a little while to actually visualize there, but you know, once it's done, hopefully you'll be happy with the results of what you have there, where you have your photorealistic texture wrapped around the mesh. So you can see our little Zapotec guy from Nexicho. Okay, um, last step here is to actually export your model so you can visualize it maybe in another software or give it off to another researcher. Um, we, what you have to do to export is go to File, Export, Export Model that. Decide where you want to put it. Now remember the three folder structure. Put it in the export folder. And we will just call it whatever we want. Um, here I'm going to call it Nexicho Glyph. And you can choose what kind of 3D model you want to export. Typically that Adobe PDF is fairly shareable between people. Um, the kind of a default or a standard format to export in would actually be OBJ. Let's click OBJ and hit save. Oh, I had it already exported, so it's just asking if I want to replace it. I'll go ahead and say yes. Um, then we have the dialog that pops up here. What I typically will do is switch my JPEG texture to PNG texture. Everything else I'll leave in default and just hit OK. So now it's exporting your model. And if you open up your actual folder folder, where you have the three folder structure, you go to your export. Um, what you'll find in there are a set of files. Now typically, I have a few more files in here because this is another project I was working on, but typically it'll just be three files. You'll have your OBJ, MTL, and whatever image file you decided to export in, and PNG in this case. So if you decided to go with JPEG, it'll be a JPEG file. So at minimum, with this OBJ, you're going to have three files, OBJ, MTL, and whatever the texture is. Um, and later on, when you kind of get more advanced with the texture dialog, you might actually create more texture files to where you might have 2, 5, 10, 40, in order to improve resolution on much larger objects. So but that's basically it um, from start to finish using your workflow tab to kind of work through the different steps in the workflow in photogrammetry. Um, the final thing I want to mention here is that between the align phase and the building your dense cloud to improve and the calibration in between your cameras after the alignment, you can go in here to tools, click optimize cameras and just hit OK. What that's going to do is just use the metadata from all of your photos, which is automatically detected, and it's going to use that to optimize the alignment of all of your cameras before you move on with the workflow. So I would suggest making that part of your standard workflow where you go from your alignment phase after the initial alignment and doing a 
optimized cameras, which is just under 